Welcome back to Old School Sports and our Out of the Park Baseball 25 series, Can We Save the Oakland A's? And the 2032 World Series is about to get underway. Unfortunately, our A's, uh, despite making the playoffs for the third time in four years, were bounced in the American League Division Series by the best team in baseball, the 111-win Kansas City Royals. And the Royals, after taking out the Yankees in the ALCS, are facing off against the Colorado Rockies in this 2032 World Series. But with just about a week and a half until the offseason gets underway, time to finally take a look at our top and bottom performers from this 86-win Oakland team here in 2032 going to be a very eventful offseason coming up for this team. Uh, when I look at this roster, it is conceivable that uh, we're going to lose four of the top five left-handed hitters on our team this offseason, have several other key losses likely to occur both as far as everyday players and with our pitching staff. So while our payroll obligations uh, next year are likely to be somewhat lower than they are today. We're also going to have a lot of talent that we need to replace on this roster. I think on the pitching side, our farm system is pretty well stocked with guys who can help at the major league level. Everyday players, it still feels like we're kind of a year or two away from an influx of talent which uh, means when we do get to free agency and when the trade market opens back up, looking for some uh, position players may be the best way for us to try to reload this roster on the fly. And as we've talked about in previous episodes when we were still playing in the playoffs, uh, we had a pretty well-balanced team this year. Finished fourth in the American League in runs scored when all was said and done. Third in the American League in runs allowed. As I noted, uh, we're going to be returning likely more of our pitching staff than our everyday players. So I think the chance of us having a uh, strong pitching staff next year are higher at this point than our chances of being able to replace all of the talent. In some cases, veteran expensive talent that we're going to lose as far as our position players. Pitching wise, uh, we could conceivably have four of our five guys back from our rotation. Jackson Ferris, uh, the left-hander who we picked up in a big trade with San Francisco four years ago at this point, coming off uh, arguably the best year of his career, 13-12 and 12 record, 355 ERA, struck out 226 and put up a 4.7 war for us. Uh, so it was the best year of his career, uh, and he is a guy who has steadily improved from his rookie year with the Giants, his war um, basically increasing every year throughout his career. He's a uh, left-handed pitcher. He's fragile as far as his injury proneness, and this last arbitration year is going to be in the range of $17 million, so it won't be inexpensive to bring Ferris back, but given that... Uh, I think the most likely way for us to keep this team competitive is through pitching and defense. Maybe a situation where we explore the opportunities of Ferris in the trade market, but ultimately end up bringing him back with the thought that uh, we could trade him next year around the trade deadline if we're not as competitive as we hope to be. Or uh, if we don't end up moving on from him, make a qualifying offer to him and at least get some draft pick compensation. Uh, when you think about a contract extension with him, he's looking for $28 million a year um, on average. Uh, so I think that is probably a bigger commitment than we can afford to make, which is why letting him play out his final arbitration season may be the path of least resistance for us. Chase Burns, a guy who we picked up in a trade with the Dodgers a couple years ago, uh, is also heading into his final arbitration season. 
9 and 10 with a 415 ERA this year. Uh, did also strike out over 200 batters, put up a 3.2 war for us. Like the fact that he throws uh, in triple digits occasionally, even though he's going to be 30 years old soon. His ARB number is about 11 million, so certainly not going to be cheap to bring him back. And when he's thinking about a longer term deal, looking for 23 million a year over six years. Um, so also pretty expensive. I don't think we can make a long term commitment to Burns, but we could conceivably bring both of those guys back and the reason it'll be important to bring potentially those two back is that uh ty madden another veteran who we picked up as a rental this year and he was very solid for us seven and five three point seven six era is actually headed to free agency rather than into a final arbitration year and he's looking for 24 million a year for five years so particularly if we bring Ferris and Burns back for, say, about $26, $27 million between the two of them, to me that seems like a better alternative for next season at least than bringing back Madden, who's older than either of them, at $24 million just for himself. Mason Miller will likely be back. Uh, we had given him a slightly front-loaded contract, and we're now in the team option point of that seven-year deal we gave to him uh, several years ago uh coming off of the year that he's coming off five million dollars is a uh real good price he was 12 and 6 with a 357 era 2.7 war he's fragile but um between our usual strategy of an aggressive tiredness hook and also having him on a pitch count we've generally been able to keep him uh pretty healthy over the last several seasons and our number five starter at this point is Jason DeCaro, uh, who is also signed um, similar to Miller to a deal that uh, bought out some minimum arbitration and free agent years with some team options at the end. Uh, DeCaro this year, 10 and 9 with a 407 ERA, barely a win above replacement, uh, so he wasn't great, but he was still fine and particularly given the fact that we're going to be having at least one hole in the rotation from Madden and possibly more holes in the rotation if we move on from Ferris or Burns, uh, bringing DeCaro back seems like an obvious decision for us to make. So the good news when I think about next season is that I think it's realistic for us to bring back four out of the five members of our starting rotation uh, which should put us in a pretty good situation to keep this pitching staff strong and competitive. Bullpen is going to be a little bit of a different story, though. Uh, Andrew Nardi will be back. Uh, we got him in a trade with Cleveland last year, and they retained his contract. Uh, so he is a uh, very valuable asset. Had a rough year, quite honestly, 5-9 and nine with 22 saves, 4.35 ERA, and was below replacement level, but... Looking at his ratings and his stuff and his arsenal um, and the fact that we've got him next year for the final year of his contract for free, essentially, I uh, tend to think he will be back with us. Kevin Kelly, uh, unfortunately, likely will not be. Picked him up in a trade with Texas uh, midway through this season, and he did a nice job for us with a 307 ERA over 58 and two-thirds innings pitched. Uh, the veteran, unfortunately, is uh, looking for pretty significant money, $18 million a year over four years, given that he's going to be turning 35 later this month, uh, as good as he was for us. That doesn't seem like a number that we can hit. It's possible that our longtime closer, Chase Lee, may have pitched his last game in Oakland as well. 3-8 and eight this year, only nine saves as we tried to let Nardi take over as closer. Had an ERA just above four, was actually almost a win below replacement level. We've got a team option for $4 million for him next year. Um, I think we're going to likely explore whether he has any value in the trade market with that team option before we decide on it. 
He's been a solid pitcher for us over the years, uh, but being realistic, he's 34 years old now, and he's had ERAs over four each of the last two seasons while being slightly below replacement level. Uh, to me, $4 million seems a lot for him at this point, but he certainly has been a pretty valuable Rule 5 draft pick. Uh, picked him in that first Rule 5 draft from the Rangers in 2024. And uh, he's saved 145 games for us over the years, despite the fact that he's not a particularly intimidating pitcher with his arsenal. Jeremy Scholl, uh, eighth round pick from 2027, likely to have a more prominent role in the bullpen for us. He put up a 365 ERA over 74 innings this year, still making the major league minimum, uh, and with the potential that. Uh, Kelly and Lee will both be gone. Likely that Scholl will have an even bigger role next year. Henry Lalane will be back as well. Uh, he is heading into bigger arbitration numbers, uh, but the left-handed pitcher did a solid job for us. 334 ERA with over a strikeout per inning. He has an arsenal where he can start or relieve. It's not inconceivable uh, if we do move on from Madden as expected that uh, Lalane could be competing for a spot in our rotation next year. Daniel Espino was a rental. Uh, he did a respectable job for us over 24 innings, but he is uh, going to be 32 years old soon, and he's looking for $9.5 million a year over three years, given his age and that he's wrecked physically. I think I'd rather put that kind of money into somebody like Chase Burns rather than Espino. Uh, Alex Vessia, the left-handed reliever, will be back. He was respectable for us again, 372 ERA over 38 and two-thirds innings. Guy that we picked up on waivers. Signed for next year at $1.4 million, and uh, he will likely be back as a left-handed arm in our bullpen. That said, as we've talked about, Espino, Lee, and Kelly are likely gone. So we are going to have some uh, roles that we need to fill in the bullpen. Fortunately, there are a few options. Uh, Vince Shaver missed the entire year with a torn UCL, uh, but the 15th round pick out of Lamar from 2028 was solid in AA a year ago. And looking at his profile... Um, I think as long as he looks somewhat like this on the other side of the injury, he could be competing for a spot on the team next year. Honestly, more likely that he'll probably start the year in AAA um, since he has never played above the AA level. But as a 26-year-old uh, um, with two option years left, we've got some uh, options with him, even though he's getting a little bit older. Another couple pitchers that... Uh, could ultimately be helping us down the line as well uh, when we look at our 40-man roster um, who could provide us with some help. Josh Teeples, unfortunately also recovering from an injury, going to be out another three months after surgery to remove bone chips. Um, but the right-hander, um, although he didn't have a great year for us in AAA, certainly has a profile that indicates he could be a useful arm out of the bullpen if we need uh, less expensive options. R.J. Cope um, is a guy who we picked in the third round back in 2026. Uh, he was respectable this year in AAA. We didn't end up uh, calling him up, um, but he could be competing for a spot on the major league roster as well next year. And last, uh, but hopefully not least, Chris Carl, another guy who's injured at this point with a torn flexor tendon, going to be out six to seven months, so we would not have him at the start of the season. But the 11th round draft pick from 2027 um, was pretty solid this year. Um, was in a small sample size in double A, really good, not allowing any runs and striking out four and two innings. And then he was also pretty productive at the triple A level with 35 strikeouts and 31 innings and a sub three ERA uh, before he suffered that torn flexor tendon. So 
between the likes of Cope and Carl and um, Teeples, as well as Shaver, um, there is some young talent in this organization that uh, could be fighting for spots in the bullpen next year. Although, uh, as we noted, a couple of those guys are coming back from injuries and probably won't be ready on opening day and also may not look exactly as they looked before the injury when they come back. But we do have some options there that I think will allow us to kind of uh, fill in some of the holes that we're going to create in the bullpen. And with guys like Lelaine on board, uh, we do have some options if we need to uh, move someone into the rotation. The last guy that we hadn't really talked about um, who merits discussion as well is Caden Dana, who was a starter for us for a good chunk of this year, 16 starts on the season. Um, wasn't great, had a 475 ERA over 108 innings, but certainly has a profile that indicates he could be um, back in the mix to be a starter with us next year. Um, signed to a pretty reasonable contract. Um, he didn't end up making the postseason roster for the second round series that we lost, uh, which is why he wasn't showing up here. But um, between Dana and Lelaine, feel like we probably have guys who could certainly be a fifth starter for us if we inevitably move on from Madden and need to promote the likes of Miller and DeCaro up a spot in the rotation. So I feel like uh, certainly the loss of a top flight starter like Ty Madden is going to leave a hole on this team as well as potentially moving on from good relievers like Kelly, Lee, and Espino. But we do have some youngsters uh, that we've drafted over the years who look like they're close to being able to help us. We've got the Rule 5 draft in about two months where we might also find a guy or two who could help our bullpen. So I think um, we're probably not going to change too, too much as far as our pitchers this offseason. Uh, if we invest money in the free agent market, my hunch is it's probably going to be with position players because that's where the potential holes are much more significant. And as our loyal viewers who have been following us since the start of this series know, Our offense has typically been our problem with the A's. As we talked about uh, when all was said and done this year, we had fourth best offense in the American League as far as scoring runs. But as I've alluded to, we are going to be losing massive chunks of that offense this offseason. Uh, it's conceivable we could lose both of our catchers. Uh, Drake Baldwin, like the defense, um, and he's been respectable offensively for us uh, the last couple years. Put up a 1.8 war this year. We've got a team option for $5.5 million for him next season, which for what he is, isn't a horrible number. But as we talked about in the last episode, we've got the young catcher, Jadon Boakai, and we think that... Uh, he gives us very similar defense to Baldwin, arguably a little better because his arm is a little better. And I think that his bat may be just as good as Baldwin's, although he's probably not going to draw quite as many walks. He's younger, he's not fragile, and he's a lot cheaper. So I'm hoping there might be a little bit of value in the trade market for Baldwin right when uh, the offseason begins. And uh, maybe we'll be able to get a piece that can help our offense back for him. Max Coffer, who's been our backup catcher uh, this past year, is now headed to arbitration where he's going to be making $2.4 million. Uh, really like his glove, like the high work ethic and intelligence, and he was competent as a uh, starting catcher for us, primarily against left-handed pitching, really more of a backup who uh, usually started against lefties, put up an 81 WRC plus and a 0 0.7 war. But as much as we like his defense, looking at his profile, 
I think it's conceivable that we can get a pretty similar player who's making the major league minimum. So Coffer is another guy that uh, we may look to deal in the early stages of the offseason if it'll help us get an asset that fits our team a little better and is a little more economical. Similar situation with uh, Chase DeLauder. He bounced back from a pretty slow start to the season to actually be a slightly above average offensive player with a 102 WRC+, plus, 32 doubles, 11 homers, 50 ribbies. Um, another left-handed bat that we could be losing. We're heading into his team option years. Uh, it's $6 million as important as keeping some semblance of left-handed hitters is going to be for us. And when we look at this roster, Drake Baldwin, lefty hitter, might be gone. Chase DeLauder, lefty hitter, might be gone. Colt Keith, lefty hitter, likely gone. Juan Soto, lefty hitter, almost certainly gone. Uh, you can see that uh, we've got, other than Bobby Cabral, who we signed to an extension not that long ago, a lot of left-handed bats to replace. So even though DeLauder is probably pretty fairly priced or maybe even overpriced at $6 million, I hope we can get something for him in a trade, but it's not inconceivable that if the trade market for lefty hitters and the free agent market for lefty hitters is really weak that we actually keep him around but hopefully it won't come to that um, i do have some loyalty to him given that he was both the alcs and the world series mvp for us in 2029 but might be time to finally move on from him we won't be moving on from kevin stubblefield uh, the youngster picked in the second round back in 2027, made his major league debut this year, uh, 279 average, 24 doubles and 11 homers and 348 at-bats, ended up putting up a 114 WRC+, plus, but it was very much a tale of two seasons for Mr. Stubblefield. Uh, early in the year, not that good. Uh, 205 average in April, 176 average in June. Was hitting a little better in July, uh, but still got sent down. But when we brought him up in August and September, and he was playing only or primarily more accurately against left handed pitching, he was absolutely incredible, hitting 467 in August, over 400 in September probably in line for a more significant role playing against both lefties and righties next year uh, given the number of players that we're likely to be losing and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get uh, stubble field into the development lab this off season maybe work on his eye or his power to uh, hopefully improve his offensive performance jefferson rojas uh, was basically our everyday second baseman much of the year 239 average, did have 31 doubles, but it all added up to an 86 WRC plus, less than a win above replacement level. Team option for $10.8 million for this upcoming season. Um, we will certainly decline that team option, but we'll look to see if anyone wants to trade for him um, and if there's any value at all in him before we do that. We picked up Devin Saltiban in a trade, knowing that we'd likely be losing some infielders this offseason. He's set to make about $2.5 million next year. Um, didn't do much offensively while he was with us, uh, but he is a versatile defensive player who's got some speed and his bat's not completely embarrassing. Uh, so given we're going to be losing so many position players this offseason, I think Saltiban... Uh, Likely will compete for a roster spot next year. Colt Keith uh, ended up having a pretty vintage Colt Keith season, except for the 235 batting average, but he finished with 32 homers, which was second on the team. And with 111 ribbies, uh, he led the team, uh, got past his teammate Bobby Cabral in the final week or two of the season to end up leading the team in ribbies. 112 WRC plus uh, is the worst mark in his four years in Oakland. He's now on the wrong side of 30. 
He's also fragile physically. And he's looking for 24, close to 25 million a year over six years. Uh, as much as we'd love to have that left-handed back, back in the lineup, uh, just not sure if it's going to be something that we can afford to do. Justin LeBron uh, played for us primarily against left-handed pitchers this year. 233 average, 76 WRC+. plus. He's got uh, progressively less productive each uh, of the years that he's been with Oakland. But he is another guy who's versatile defensively, a captain personality, set to make around $3 million in arbitration. Uh, it's conceivable he'll be back with us next year. Going to have an interesting decision on Brian Rincon. Rincon played a bit better towards the end of the year, uh, but it was still a rough season. Hit just a buck eighty-five this year. Twenty-three doubles, only one triple, and only two homers. Stole eighteen bases. He walked ninety-seven times. He's got a good eye, but it all added up to a seventy WRC plus and a one point seven WAR. He's now been with us for six years, and uh, this was by far the least productive of the six years he's had with us. He's fragile physically, but despite that fragility, he somehow has played over 140 games for us every year. Uh, excellent defensive shortstop. Had another uh, really nice year this year with a 10.4 zone rating, 1.061 defensive efficiency. Certainly will leave a huge hole in our defense if uh, we move on from Rincon. Looking at his batting ratings, I think um, the 70 WRC plus he put up this year is unexpectedly low, but we have to be fair about things, and uh, he hasn't been a league average offensive player by both OPS plus and WRC plus since 2029. Not looking for the same kind of uh, crazy money as Colt Keith, but eight years, $12 million for a glove only guy is uh, a pretty significant commitment for a team like the A's to consider. Tend to think he won't be back, but it's not impossible. A lot depends on the value in the trade market of some of the guys that we've mentioned earlier and whether or not we might be able to get a potential shortstop back in some trades that we'll be looking to make when the offseason does begin. So when we think about our catchers and our infielders, uh, you can see the amount of turnover that's going to happen. Um, the only three guys that I'm pretty confident are absolutely going to be back would be Stubblefield, LeBron, and Saltibon. And um, that's going to leave a lot of holes because we, uh, in a best case scenario, we've got a first baseman and a second baseman, and we're going to need to find a third baseman, a shortstop, some backup infielders as well as uh, at least one catcher, assuming that we do promote Boakai. The outfield um, is a little bit better situation, um, but that being said, we're still going to lose one of the premier hitters in baseball history. Uh, Juan Soto did an excellent job for us after we rented him for the last two and a half months of the season with a 155 WRC+. Plus. 15 homers, 47 ribbies, and 251 at-bats. But not surprisingly, Soto is looking for almost $39 million a year over six years uh, for a guy who's already now 34 years old. Uh, just not a number that this A's team has any chance of being able to touch. Fortunately, though, the other four outfielders on our team and on our roster are likely to be back next year. Jake Ortega, um, the number three overall pick from 2029, had an outstanding rookie year, hit 316, scored over 100 runs, 46 doubles, 18 homers, 13 steals, 
had a 145 WRC plus and a war of almost six. We signed him to a long-term deal uh, before this past season, and uh, he is going to be a very important player for us going forward. Uh, the switch hitting outfielder looks like uh, he could be a special one, and he's going to have an even more prominent role in our lineup next year. Luis Tavares is a guy we uh, called up in September after just 26 games in AAA. Used him as a very occasional pinch hitter in the month of September, where he did well, going three for six in an admittedly tiny sample size. Uh, but he did kind of uh, keep the good mojo going in the postseason in the game that Soto got hurt. He came in and he went two for five with a homer and five ribbies in his lone postseason action. Uh, he looks likely to be a utility outfielder for us next year. Probably will be in the starting lineup against left-handed pitching. Luis Lara still signed to a very reasonable deal. He'll be making two and a half million next year. Uh, fragile physically, but he is an outstanding defensive center fielder. Hit just 221 this year, um, did steal 14 bases, but uh, not a really good offensive season for him. But given his defensive skill and some proficiency on the base paths, uh, he's still going to be an important player for us going forward given the amount of money he's making. Uh, fortunately, with Ortega around now, though, uh, we don't have to be playing Lara in center field every day. And if he does get banged up here and there, we've got a more than competent center fielder on the team in Ortega. Last but not least, Bobby Cabral, who we recently signed to an extension. Uh, he had a real interesting rookie year. or Actually, it wasn't his rookie year. Um, his rookie year was technically last year with Detroit. Traded for him this past offseason. Um, knew he had some weaknesses with the strikeouts and ability to make contact. But we're very intrigued by his incredible home run power, which was uh, bolstered in the development lab last offseason. Led the team with 39 homers, second on the team with 108 ribbies. Uh, did lead the league with 252 strikeouts, hit this 229. Still put up a 109 WRC plus, though. And uh, he is the lone left handed hitter on this roster that uh, we're going to have back next year. So from that perspective, I think it's pretty important um, that we did get him signed because uh, as we've talked about, Soto and Keith are almost certainly gone and Baldwin and DeLauder both could be gone as well. So uh, we're going to be looking for some help at the left-handed side of the plate in this offseason. And as we think about other guys who might be able to help us, uh, Ken Weaver, the young catcher, spent the year in AA this year, but uh, he was up with us briefly in 2031. If we end up moving on from both Baldwin and Kaufer, uh, Weaver could be fighting to be a backup behind Boakai. Uh, Brian Ramos was a rental for us this year, ended up getting hurt and missing the playoffs, had just 50 games or 50 at bats for us across 14 games before he got hurt. He is uh, looking for pretty big money, almost $20 million a year over five years. Probably not a number that we're going to be able to hit. Um, so he'll be gone. Uh, Hideki Arakawa will be back in the mix to be a backup infielder next year. Uh, certainly would expect at this point with the number of infielders we're going to need to be looking for that uh, he'll be on the roster unless we make some changes. We've also got several younger guys, Bertrand Albrighton, Israber Stewart, Alejandro Landin, and Juan Rodas, who are on the 40-man roster. I honestly don't think any of them are really ready for the majors. Um, we might have some interesting decisions to make this offseason with the likes of Rodas. Uh, he was an international free agent signing in 2025, and uh, he's just completing his last option year. Doesn't look ready for the majors. Um, if he can help us get a trade done by still having maybe a little bit of trade value, it might be someone that we move on from. And uh, not a ton of outfielders on this team. So um, it's not inconceivable that one of these young guys makes the team as a backup, but it's probably not a perfect scenario for us in 2033. 
because I do feel like um, these guys are all at least a year plus away at this point. So uh, we're going to have some holes to fill in the infield, possibly some holes to fill in catcher, and uh, going to need to add an outfielder as well. So it's going to be a very busy off season for us. Taking a look at the salary situation, uh, the good news is our salaries are expected to go down by about $7 million next year, uh, so that's po positive. Uh, the bad news, though, as we've talked about, with uh, salaries going down just $7 million, the likes of Ramos, Kevin Kelly, Daniel Espino, Mason Black, Ty Madden, Juan Soto, Colt Keith, and Brian Rincon could all be off the team. Now, we do have an opportunity to open up a little more money, as I talked about Chase DeLauder, Drake Baldwin, Chase Lee, and Jefferson Rojas, all on team options, are uh, either definitely not going to be back at that number in the case of Rojas, uh, and possibly won't be back in the cases of Chase Lee, Drake Baldwin, and Chase DeLauder. But even if we open up about uh, $25 million and move on from all four of those players, um, that's basically just enough money to bring back a Colt Keith if we wanted to. We could bring back, you know, uh, Brian Rincon with a Daniel Espino with that kind of money. Um, Kevin Kelly with Brian Rincon. We could bring back Ty Madden with that money. Um, just don't know that there's any great options. Um, it is nice that we've got the ability to open up some money with those team options. That's the reason that we try to get them in as many contracts um, in the final years as possible to give us some flexibility. But um, even if we move on from four of the five guys with team options and keep Mason Miller... It basically just puts us in the running for one legitimate free agent. And as we've talked about, uh, we probably need at least one catcher. We need a starting third baseman. We need a starting shortstop. We need a utility infielder slash maybe a starting second baseman. And we need a utility outfielder. Um, so spending all of that potential money on just one guy might be a bit ambitious. Um, I'd love to figure out a way to bring Colt Keith back, but uh, his age and his fragility do have me a bit concerned that it might not be the best medium to long-term decision to uh, re-up with Mr. Keith. And as we noted, uh, the best team in the AL, the Kansas City Royals, is going to be facing off against the best team in the NL, the Colorado Rockies, in this 2032 World Series. We'll find out who the champion is. Um, and then we'll find out uh, whether we still have a job at the start of this offseason. Uh, we've talked in previous episodes about the mixed at best results we've had with our owner goals for this year. I would think that uh, three out of four straight years in the playoffs with a budget that has been the lowest in baseball over that time should be enough to keep our job, but you never know with Mr. Fisher. And this World Series has thus far been an absolute classic. Um, the home team has won every game. But every game in the series has been a one-run game. Uh, the Royals won the opener one to nothing, and then fourteen to thirteen at home. Uh, looked like they were in pretty good shape. But in Colorado, the Rockies won five to four, eight to seven, and then six to five. So uh, the Royals, with their hundred and eleven wins, are one loss away from losing the World Series to the ninety-seven win Rockies. Uh, but as I noted. Um, these were the best teams in each of their league. Uh, the Royals first in the league in both runs scored and runs against in the AL. Uh, the Rockies first in the league in runs scored and extremely impressively for a team playing in their park uh, were second in the National League in runs against this year. 
and a road team has finally won. Uh, once again, it was a one-run game. The Rockies in game number six defeat the Royals to claim the 2032 World Series four games to two, but uh, absolutely incredible series with every game in the series being a one-run game. Can't ask for more drama than that. And as I noted, it's going to be a very busy offseason for us. Uh, option year decisions on DeLauder, Rojas, Miller, Lee, and Baldwin, uh, most of which we're likely to decline. But as I talked about, likely to be uh, shopping all of those players over the next few days between now and our next episode to see uh, what, if any, value those contracts might have to other teams as we try to open up a little bit more financial flexibility. Development facilities are open, so we're going to be giving that some serious thought between now and the next episode. Um, we'll certainly talk about that next time around. Going to have a number of arbitration eligible players. Uh, but the most interesting thing is going to be to see our uh, review of season goals and then our new budget. Uh, secretly hope we would make the playoffs, but he didn't expect it, but happy with what we did. Uh, improved our home runs a little bit, which he was content with. Um, keep looking for opportunities to improve through the draft. Not pleased with fan interest. Uh, not pleased that we didn't improve in extra inning games. Made the playoffs. Um, he's a little sad we couldn't bring a championship to Oakland, a uh, second championship. Um, it's been three years since this franchise has won. Yes, given that we've had the lowest budget and base roll for nine consecutive years that I've been running this team and several years before that as well. The fact that we actually won a championship should have you um, being more positive, Mr. Fisher. But uh, wants us to win another championship again. He's good with our performance, accomplishing his goals. His overall mood with us is happy. Uh, wants us this next year to reach the playoffs, upgrade at second base, steal more bases, improve attendance, continue bringing up drafted players, increase fan interest, and build a team that can win another championship in the next six seasons. So uh, those goals don't seem uh, horrible. Question is, what type of uh, budget will we have to try to achieve those goals? And we're at 164 million, um, so that's a little bump up. Um, so that is positive for us. Um, guessing it's still going to be the lowest budget in baseball, but I think that we were at maybe 158 last year. Yeah, 158 is exactly what we were at last year. So a six million dollar bump to the budget. Um, 164 million is the most that we've ever had with this team. Uh, still likely going to be the least in baseball. I think we were about 20 million behind the Pirates when we were at 158. Uh, so probably still going to be in a difficult situation. Uh, only three of these goals that we talked about are applicable for next year. Um, reaching the playoffs, improving at second base, and improving in stolen bases. Uh, we'll have to figure out whether either of uh, those second ones that are low priority, the second and third ones, are uh, things that we might want to negotiate with him. Uh, medium term, want to improve fan interest. Longer term, want to improve our draft record and then build that championship team over the next six seasons. So uh, going to have a little more financial flexibility in this offseason, but it's still going to be a tough situation with a lot of turnover, particularly among those position players that we talked about. And you can see in theory we've got a little bit of money available, uh, but that is only because uh, we've taken our draft budget down to nothing, which certainly isn't a number that's ultimately going to work for us. Um, $164 million is the uh, 30th and last budget in all of baseball. Uh, right now we're actually up to 28th in player payroll. Uh, but that certainly will be changing as uh, we sign some players, have a fair number of arbitration-eligible guys, as we've talked about, uh, 
think most of these guys will be coming back with us, um, but the big decisions and the big money decisions are obviously the pitchers, Burns and Ferris. Um, Mason Black, Colt Keith, and Brian Rincon are all guys that we can submit qualifying offers to. Certainly got to submit one to Colt Keith. Um, and then a lot of other free agents as well in Espino, Kelnick, Kelly, Madden, Ramos, and Soto. Um, Going to be a lot of talent leaving this team via free agency and also potentially uh, a lot of talent uh, leaving this team in terms of some option year decisions that we need to make. And uh, we're not going to bring back everyone who's arbitration eligible as well. I'd say that uh, Kaufer, Arakawa are probably the most in jeopardy. But I could see a scenario where a Saltaban or a LeBron doesn't end up with us as well. I think a lot is going to depend on, uh, as we're shopping some of our players over the next few days, if any of these guys on these option years have some significant trade value to maybe help us bring on some talent in a position that we need help at. And things can change over the next few weeks before free agency begins. And who knows, maybe there will be a real interesting international free agent available as well who uh, can fill a hole for us potentially. But uh, some interesting talent that might be on the market, not that we're probably going to really be able to play in the 30 million dollar range for wrecked guys like Jackson Chorio or Michael Harris II, but... A very weird scenario for these Oakland A's who had the lowest budget in baseball last year but still have a number of prominent free agents, Juan Soto, Colt Keith, Brian Rincon, and Brian Ramos are all among the top uh, 15 or 20 uh, position player free agents out there. So uh, definitely going to be a exodus of talent as far as position players, uh, the pitching situation, we'll take a look at the uh, potential pitchers that are going to be out there. And uh, Ty Madden, who will also be losing, is viewed as the uh, top potential free agent out there. Kevin Kelly, also on the team, uh, another pretty good guy. So uh, we are losing or likely to lose some pretty significant talent in free agency. Uh, it's also likely going to uh, result with some of those departures in a pretty significant hit to our fan interest. So uh, we're going to have to press a lot of levers very well this offseason, uh, but we're going to be turning over the team significantly. It's going to be a very different roster in 2033, and the goal, as uh, Mr. Fisher has outlined, is going to be to turn this team over but still guide it back into the playoffs for the fourth time in five years. And we'll find out uh, the early stages of our progress towards that goal in our next episode. Until then, thanks so much for watching, and hope you have a great day.